Today is October 7th, 1998. We're interviewing Ruth Sachs in her home in Chula Vista, California. My name is Linda Roth, and the interview's in English. What's your name? My name is Ruth Sachs. Could you spell that, please? R-U-T-H-S-A-X. What was your name at birth? Ruth Goldschmidt and with the Czech ending of OVA. Could you spell that, please? R-U-T-H-G-O-L-D-S-E-H-M-I-E-D, and the ending is O-V-A. Did you ever have any other names that you went no. by? What's your date of birth? Just a nickname. What was that? They called me Golda. Your date of birth? 7-6-1928. In other words, July 6, 1928. How old are you today? 70. Where were you born? I was born in Moravsky Schumpert. That's northern Moravia in Czechoslovakia. Can you spell that, please? M O R A V S K Y S U M P E R K. What were your maternal grandparents' names? Uh, maternal grand your mother's parents, parents. Franz and Nettie Cohn and my grandmother's maiden name was Krakauer where did they where were they from um, they were from Nikolsburg and Politz both what kind of people were they like sweet people I never knew my grandfather because he died, uh, he got killed in the First World War in 1916 uh, in Italy. And your grandmother? And my grandmother was the sweetest woman. She never remarried and she devoted her life just to the family. And until she died when she was 63 years old in Theresienstadt in the concentration camp. And she had cancer of the stomach and twisting of the intestines. And that's where we lost her. Can you recall a particularly fond memory you had with your grandma? I uh, spent every summer uh, vacation with her. And um, I had my bicycle there for the summer. My aunt, uncle, and uh, my cousin also lived with my grandmother. So I had company there. And it was up by a little village close to Brno. Uh, I would say a lot of Jewish people. They had a big synagogue, and there was a nice Jewish life for a young little Jewish child. And I remember Grandma spoiling me. I slept in her room, and um, whenever she um, she gave us stars for being uh, good during a day, mm -hmm. and at the end of the week she rewarded us if every day we had all good stars. <laughs> How did she reward you? Um, she gave us uh, pennies. In other words, it was Hellas. And we, at the end of the week, we got an ice cream next door. <laughs> the, it, the children at that time were more appreciative of little things than today. What were your paternal grandparents' names? Okay. Uh, Clara and Josef Goldschmidt. And she was born Adler my grandma and um, my grandpa was a six-footer and my grandma was a tiny little woman and very very sweet i have wonderful memories of my grandfather he was one of ten children the grandpa and he retired when he was 49 years old he had four sons and the four sons made sure that he retired in the most nicest way. They supported him. One son let him live, and the other three sons um, supported him financially. He had the nicest suits, and he was the one that was going from um, family to family visiting. And um, he was very religious, and even taught my husband for the bar mitzvah. But um, the 
four sons were proud of having the father being the matriarch of the family and make sure that, that everybody meets everybody. And so this I remember about my grandpa. And how about your grandma? My grandma was a sweet woman. She was more in the background, also very religious. And it was family afternoon, every Shabbat afternoon, where we met and the children, we got uh, coins to go and go to the uh, candy store. And uh, any family problems that arose between the four brothers, that was discussed on that afternoon. And my grandfather made sure that everything is like a judge, that everything is going to be fine. <laughs> what was your father's name? Oscar, O-S-K-A-R. Where was he raised? He was raised in Politz, in Pohorelice. What kind of education did he have? Um, he had a great school and a continuation school, but no college. It was like a business. He went straight into business, and then he had to be like, three years uh, working for a company before he was allowed to go um, and do his own. What did he do for a living? After Dad got married, he opened up a store in Moravsky Schumberg, and he stayed there for six years. And then he became a, a traveling salesman, and my mother was in charge of a showroom. And what my daddy used to do, he invested money from what he made on the store in Moravsky Schumberg in patents. And uh, so, for example, uh, he was a traveling salesman for Bratri Malerove, that was the factory where they manufactured for the first time men knee eyes with the elastic around before, they used to have to have a sub suspenders, men's suspenders, you know, where they hooked it. So that was one. The other one was he invested in knirps, <coughs> which is the folding umbrella. And then he became the traveling salesman for that. Then uh, Latsina Company, which uh, had the plush um, tablecloths. It was like a velvet, printed velvet. The tablecloths and the hanging things for the wall to match, and for the Ottomans. And so these were the main products that my father represented. Oh, and also uh, from the Tatra Mountains, he had hand-hooked uh, lace uh, uh, curtains. Describe your father as a dad. I didn't see much of my father, because he was gone from Monday to Friday. But the little bit that he, when he came home, um, he had a lot of friends. And he used to be, uh, he, he loved to go to a coffee shop and mix with his friends on the weekends. Uh, Saturday and Sunday was always family uh, day. Saturday with his parents. And Sunday, my father drove to the little village where my grandma was, my mother's mother. And we spent the day there. So um, I remember my dad. Um, liking soccer and so whenever there was a big soccer game uh, all the uncles and everybody went together my dad drove and the mothers and the kids had to stay home <laughs> but he was sweet he was a sweet man very sweet man and at the end of his life he lived with me for six years here and that's when I really got to know him because um, all the stories he never had a chance of telling me but now that he retired and he had time, so we shared the most beautiful thing, times that was after mother died. Do you have a particularly fond memory of your father you'd like to share? Yes. Um, he liked the mountains. And so we went into Tatra, and uh, uh, he liked, um, so we went into the mountains, and he always wanted to show me where the waterfalls are. and. That's where the gypsies <coughs> used to go through the woods and pick the, what they call the um, strawberries, the little pearl strawberries. And my father um, laughed by the glasses of the strawberries. And um, then he used to say that he picked it himself. <laughs> but in reality, he bought them. <laughs> 
but uh, that I used to enjoy going on vacations with my father, yes, because he was a sportsman, he was outgoing as a young man, he was skiing. My mother was uh, also a sportswoman, she was a tennis player and a runner and a uh, swimmer, and so I had nice times with my parents. What was your mother's name? Erna, E-R-N-A. And where was she born? She was born in the same little village in Politz, Bohotelice. Do you know how they, your parents met? Yes, um, they were two families who were bakers. And one family, they were competition. And um, their grandpa on my father's side was the poorer one. And he had no uh, electric machinery. But the grandpa on my mother's side uh, he was the richer one and had the military contract because there was a big military barrack there to bake bread for the military. And so he had uh, the machinery to do that. It was too bad that my grandpa died uh, so early when my mother was 10 years old. And then all the machinery and everything was sold to the other grandpa. And for a while, I mean, they knew each other, but they didn't want to know each other. But in later years, around when my mom became like 18 years old and so on, and uh, father went against uh, family's advice and uh, started dating my mother, and sure enough, they fell in love with each other. How would you describe your mother as a mother? She was a matriarch. She could sense um, she could sense the situation and make the best of it. And she could advise the family members. When um, her father died, she had really had to take charge of her s brother and sister because my grandma got very sick. Not only did she was 10 years old, and she had to take over the store. They started uh, having, they couldn't do the bakery no more, so they opened up a little haberdashery. My mother was the one who did the shopping in, in the big city in Brno and so on, just to help out and keep the family, and that's what more or less stayed with my mother, and even in the concentration camp, it was, I would say, my mother that saved my life. Because she got a job in the kitchen and made sure that there's always a little soup left for me. <laughs> Would you share one of your fondest memories of your mother? My fondest memories? She lived for the family. And she was very good to her brother and to the sister. And even if she emigrated, she f had a guilty complex and used to send them every month's money. From the little bit of earning that she had, uh, working for Ratna Manufacturing and putting th uh, pulling threads um, from coats, because sh that was the job that she had, she saved and all every month she tried to support her brother and sister. But what the memory that I have was she was always here when a family member needed advice. And they never walked away without having an answer from my mother. And this is how I remember. Very energetic, very strong, but still soft and good. Did you have siblings? No, I had no brother and sister. Describe the town you lived in as a child. Well, first I lived in Moravsky Schumberg, that is Mary Schoenberg. And um, there was few Jewish families, a small synagogue, <coughs> a small little temple. And I had uh, a best girlfriend that I'm still in touch with now. She lives in Australia. And her name is uh, Dita Heilig, and her na married name is Dita Honig. And we were inseparable, absolutely inseparable. She has a cousin, Robert Heilig, that I'm also still in touch with. And we saw each other, not only did they came to visit me here in the United States, but I made a point and visited them in Australia. And um, um, there was four girls that we were very close. Ruthie Halpert and Erika and uh, uh, Heilig. And so um, we stayed in touch even after I moved into another city, we still stayed in touch, and even till today, uh, Erika just died a few years ago, and Dita is still alive. Um, that was until my sixth birthday. 
I had another very close friend, and uh, uh, that was Heinz Spitzkopf. And uh, too bad to say, but he died on cancer. Uh, he got cancer in his lungs, and when he was 50 some odd years old, he died. So that was the children from the little village. <laughs> what did your house to. look like in the little village? Okay, um, my parents had an apartment in the building where the store was, and um, we had a cook and a maid that uh, I would say a lady who took care of me because my mother was working, and um, they had a store in in Moravsky Shumper before my dad uh, moved to Brno and became a traveling salesman. What do you remember of those first six years um, about your home and family life? I, there was an elderly couple mm, that we used to call Strauss, uh, their name was Strauss, and we used to call him Strauss Batch and Strauss Nanny, the uh, best uncle and aunt. Uh, we used to call them an elderly couple, and they used to love me, and I used to love to go and visit them. Um, that's when I started kindergarten, and uh, I loved it. I used to love to go to that kindergarten. And there was an old man that tried to scare all the little children always. And we used to call him Yekele. And this Yekele scared the hell out of me. And so I never wanted to pass the bridge unless somebody walked with me to go on that bridge. Because he used to sit there and, tried, and it was his hobby. He tried to scare the little children. So that was the bad part. But otherwise, I have good remember. There was a Dr. Bodansky. He used to be my family doctor. And he cured everything with uh, heating lamps. Every time you had something wrong, oh, five minutes under the heating lamp. <laughs> you moved when? I was six years old in 1934. And where did you move to? I moved to Brno, mm -hmm. uh, to the capital of Moravia. And describe your home there. Okay, that was the second largest city, and uh, here we had a larger apartment, and the, we did not pay for the apartment because it was the factory who paid for the apartment, and at the same time the showroom was there too. So we had a cook, and again a lady who took care of me. And because my mother was very, very busy. And we had extra bedrooms where we used to entertain buyers and things like that. And Dad was on the road during the week. What would a daily routine during the week be for you at that time? Uh, are you, as a child? Yes. OK, as a child, I uh, went to school just around the corner from where I used to live. And um, then my mother. Uh, I would say the lady that took care of me uh, after school, she used to pick me up. And I, twice a week, I used to go for religious training. Then I used to go to Maccabi exercises. Or in summertime, I went swimming and um, play maybe in the park with other children and things like that. And then in the evening, we always had a sit down dinner where the family sat down with my mother and everybody sat down and had dinner together. It's, uh, that was nice. That was I was kind of looking forward, and that's when my mother talked. Oh, yes, my mother used to do her grocery shopping and everything very, very early in the morning. She used to go to the uh, open market, and afterwards she used to play tennis before she started work. That was in the morning. Can you recall as a child what your favorite meal was, your favorite foods? Schnitzel and rice flesh. And what is the what uh, is this? There's a veal cutlet and uh, rice with veal. And still do. <laughs> Did you have chores to do as a young child? I would say later on when we didn't have the maid no more. But until then, no. Oh, to keep my toys in order, I would say. But that, uh, that was it. Do you recall a favorite toy? Yes, my teddy bear. And I lost it when in Theresienstadt in Auschwitz. But I got another one after the war. How would your parents discipline you? Standing in the corner. And they said, and in case I would not listen or it would get worse, 
then they're going to put peace on the floor and I have to kneel on, my, on the peace, but I never had to do it. <laughs> on hard peace. What was your favorite holiday? Favorite holiday? Um, maybe Passover at that time, because the whole family got together. It was beautiful. And I remember still my grandpa chanting and the melodies, and then always beforehand he tried to teach a certain melody so we can participate in the service. I think that's, that's what I remember most. What role did religion play in your life as a child? I was not a very orthodox type of a child. My parents were very observant of holidays and things like that. My grandparents were orthodox. They kept kosher and everything, not my parents, because my parents were very busy. Dad was traveling and mom was working, and so we always had to have hired help and so on. But um, they um, observed to the point where they didn't eat any pork or anything like that, and that's what I was being taught to, you know. Um, I did go whenever grandpa could catch me that I went with him on Saturday morning to synagogue and uh, he made sure especially once I started uh, uh, religious classes he wanted to be sure that I start going and I, I, I went with him because as a child you could even as a girl you could be with him downstairs but if you go with another woman then you, you had to be upstairs so my mother never went and grandma didn't go either so I just went with grandpa how did you feel about going? Once I went, I was happy because I had my friends there too. I felt very Jewish all the time. I felt that uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't like religious training. That was boring to me. But once I learned something, I enjoyed doing it and observing it. <laughs> I think they, my parents had to kind of force me a little bit into it. You said you felt Jewish. What did that mean to you as a child? Um, maybe it was the association with other children who were very Zionistic in, in a like scout group where they had this uh, young uh, Zionist group and that I belonged to. And uh, maybe the association with the other children I, was my friendship a group and circle. Is that what you want to call it? What was your favorite subject in school? Drawing, exercising, and math. I didn't like language. Why? I didn't want to study grammar. Did you have non-Jewish friends? Yes. And my best friend's name was Yerina Panovska, and she is the one and uh, that when I came back from the concentration camp, I let her have my golden chain. And uh, she, that was the first thing when she saw me, she put the golden chain back on my neck and gave me a big hug and kiss and said, I'm so glad you survived. I went to public school my first four years until I was being thrown out. And then I had to go to the Jewish school. But until then, I was the only Jewish girl in the classroom, not even realizing I was Jewish or that I was different. The only time that I noticed that I was different is when they had early in the morning religious classes, um, Catholicism, because the majority were Catholics. And the priest uh, used to come and uh, teach the children. And I had to wait outside. They didn't want me in the classroom. And I remember when I was in the first grade, I was very jealous one time because they were giving out little pictures as um, uh, book stoppers, you know, just, just little things. And uh, everybody got one except me. And I said, why can't I have one? And they said to me, well, because uh, you don't believe in Maria, <laughs> so you, we won't give it to you. And I said, if I start believing in Maria, would, would you give me one too? I didn't understand the difference at the time. I was a child. I was six years old, you know. 
So that's the only time I knew that there was some difference. But the children never let me feel it. Never let me feel it. So Would your Christian friends come to your home? Oh, and you'd, absolutely. You'd go to their homes? Absolutely. 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 Until Hitler came, um, I, I don't, I didn't even realize that that, that was a um, object to, to worry about, being Jewish or not Jewish, you know. Until then, everything was fine. What did you want to be when you grew up? Oh, I want to have my own uh, gymnastic uh, hall where, um, with uh, facials and, uh, and manicures, pedicures, uh, hairdos. And, but the main thing is I was always interested in gymnastics. And in Europe they used to call it Sandazal, and that was what I wanted to own someday. And then after the war, I decided I wanted to become a designer for operas. And the reason is because when the communists came to Czechoslovakia in 1948, that was the only way I could get out of the country and go to another opera and uh, maybe copy the different styles and so on. How would you <coughs> describe yourself as a child? Uh, on the quiet side, respectful to my parents, very much so. I was always the opposite of my cousin. <laughs> How so? You know, um, not demanding anything. Where my cousin always demanded things, I didn't. I was satisfied with all my, and maybe because my parents never lacked anything. Everything was always open, and they knew. I knew that I could have it, but I didn't take it without asking. That means uh, money was never locked up, liquor was never locked up. So I never, I never needed to, to worry about that. And I didn't use it anyway. When you look back and think back before the war started, can you recall a favorite time or feeling that you had? as a child? Um, in which regard do you mean that? A sense of security or? I had, a, I had a tremendous sense of security. I was very safe at home. Um, I felt that I, my two parents trying to protect me from every face of life and trying to teach me to be self-sustaining in a way because they were depending on other people to raise me in a way because they were working themselves. But they always made sure that I know that they love me. They are trying their best to, to give me as much as they can. And I know that they were planning to retire when they were 50. Uh, five years old, and they were ready to get a big villa in the mountains, and that's where they wanted to retire. And then Hitler came, and that was it, and took their dream away. We have to change tapes. We're describing your life before the war. Can you recall the first signs of danger that you sensed? Yes. Um, the mobilization of the country, where they tried to mobilize all the soldiers. And they were expecting uh, some problems on the border front. And in reality, that was the time that uh, Sudetenland was occupied. How did that personally and affect that, uh, you? That uh, we left our uh, apartment and uh, went into the country to, quote, live in hiding until we know what's going to happen. Where'd you live? Uh, it was a little village called Dubrovnik, and um, it uh, was with farmers in a little village. 
And that lasted only just a couple of days and not even a week, and then we went back home again. What did you take with you? Oh, just for that, uh, because my father could go back and forth, we just took the most necessary things like clothing and things like that. No, no food, because the farmer furnished the food and they got paid for it. What did your parents tell you was happening? Um, they were saying that uh, Hitler already had occupied Austria and that um, we don't know what's going to happen, not realizing that Chamberlain was selling us at the time, that he made the pact with uh, Sudetenland and Czechoslovakia, you know. How old were you when things started changing? Mm, ten years old, I would say. Nine and a half, ten years old. And what had you heard of Hitler? Not, nothing at the time. Nothing at the time. I, uh, it was blank to me. You know, we were so, we, we, nobody thought this is going to happen to us in Czechoslovakia. Who would have thought of it? It was a country of very e highly educated people, and uh, they had everything. The middle class was on a higher standard than any other country. Uh, why would uh, we be occupied? Why would uh, we worry about a thing like that? We never thought this is going to happen. And it happened overnight, very fast. So <coughs> you were out hiding and you came back, you said, in a couple yes, of days? Yes, and everything was fine. Everything was fine. And then um, later on, Sudetenland was occupied. And uh, my grandmother and uh, my aunt and my uncle and my cousin, they had to leave the little village um, and had to come to Brno. And my father tried to bring as many people across the border that time. So... How did he do that? Uh, he put him in the trunk and smuggled them out. And, uh, because otherwise they would have had to go into a place called Eibenschitz where there was a big factory and they loaded up all these people in that factory. That was so inhumane that he tried to get his family out and bring them to our house. And then we found uh, apartments for them and uh, tried to help them as much as we can. And some of them emigrated later on uh, illegally to Israel or to England, and they had children's transports going to um, England and to Ireland. But then the parents couldn't go, so it often happened where um, the parents got out, not the children, and then children got killed, and vice versa. You know, I had uh, family members also affected like that. <coughs> so when your grandmother moved to, the s to Bruno with with your family. Then what started happening? Well, uh, then uh, Hitler occupied on the 14th, uh, with from the 14th to the 15th of March, um, 1939, was my mother's birthday. Uh, we were told that Hitler is marching further, not only to the Sudetenland, but he's going further than that. and. Uh, so during the night I was sleeping and my father woke me up and said, get dressed right away and run downstairs. I already ordered a taxi. And I said, what do you need a taxi for? You have a car. We had a brand new Praga Piccolo. And uh, he said, no, no, no. Uh, my car is very well known in all the villages because I'm a traveling salesman, but we need to get out. And we thought that Hitler is going to occupy only Moravia not realizing that he is occupying all Czechoslovakia at Bohemia too. So my father wanted to go with a taxi to the factory that he was working for. And uh, people were trying to get out so desperately. And they started knocking on our uh, taxi door and so on. My, and so my mother and father just jumped in. And at 12 o'clock at night, we drove off. And as you went through these little villages, especially Yehlava, people stood with clubs then and started hitting onto the cars. And it was really, really bad. And uh, from where, we, I don't know how it happened. As we kept on driving, we realized that Hitler is going to occupy all this country. 
because all of a sudden every house had already a swastika. From where did these flags came from? I mean, during the night, every house had a flag with a swastika. That must have been a tremendous underground movement then. And um, so as we drove through these villages, it was not safe. And we came into the factory, and the director of the factory had already a swastika on his lapel and said, I am now in charge of the factory, no more the two Jewish bosses. And uh, one of these bosses arrived here in the United States, and he was, uh, did very well for himself. He hooked on with, his hobby was cameras, and he hooked on with the lens uh, people. And he's the one who invented the Polaroid camera, and he never got credit for it, though, because he worked for the company. And he not knowing that he can get uh, later on uh, royalties or something, he never asked for it. So. Let's go back to the night when your father woke you so up. So anyway, we, we arrived in, this, in the factory there, and the director, Ulrich Berger was his name, said, you might as well turn around and go right home, because uh, <coughs> Czechoslovakia will be occupied, all occupied. And, but we were scared to go back with the taxi, because we saw how these people were on the streets with the clubs and everything. And so we decided we're going to go home by train. As we got the train. We didn't even go as far as Prague. We got the train, went back home, and as we walk up to our apartment, our maid still was with us, and she took care of the apartment in the meantime. Two as a men were already waiting in front of our house, confiscating my father's car, and going through the apartment like a tornado. What they were looking for, then my father made a phone call right away to the uh, director Ulrich Berger. He made another phone call because he then he let them know that the apartment is not paid by us but by the factory and that is now under the Aryan um, jurisdiction so the SS has no right to go through that apartment and so on and they declared my father w, uh, WWJ Wichtig Wirtschaftliche Jude. He's important um, to the economy the important economy as a Jew, that they need him. So temporarily, my father was uh, exempt, and he could keep his job. When you came up and s saw, you personally saw the SS men? Scared to death. I was what very scared. Uh, I ran into the house, but I, was not, I had to come back, and I had to wait outside until they finished going through the apartment, and uh, the first thing they did, they took away the mate, and the, they themselves, uh, she had to work then for a German uh, family. So we, are not, uh, we were not allowed to have maids no more and things like that. And every day, another plaque was put upon us, you know, so we were not allowed to walk after 8 o'clock, you were not allowed to go to movies, you are not allowed to go on a train, you can only go, uh, every day another rule came. Uh, on the tram, you know, in the city tram, you are only allowed to go in the front uh, portion of it. You're not allowed to sit down. Um, you are allowed to shop only between uh, 3 and 5 in the afternoon, and um, uh, then only in certain stores. Certain stores had big signs, uh, use entry forbidden, you know. And uh, so you really um, <laughs> had a hard life from then on. And the city ghetto was established. that. Uh, people who lived in villas and places, nice places, had to leave their apartments and, uh, and their houses. And they were uh, given so many square feet per person. So sometimes two, three families wound up in one room, too. Let's go back to when you first saw the SS men in your home. Mm -hmm. When you went in the house, describe what you saw and felt. I was scared. I was very, very scared when I saw the um, uh, the SS people, because I was scared that they're going to take my dad away. Okay, uh, because my mother told me, "Oh my God, I hope they don't take daddy away." Now I would not have thought of it; would not my, have my mother said that. Okay, and maybe from that moment on, I didn't realize what was happening. I couldn't understand the political situation. 
or why would I get punished just because we are Jewish? And nobody said nothing until then that this is the reason. Nobody explained it to me before. So I had no idea that this is a cause. So once my mother only said, I hope they won't take that away, you know, until that moment, I just took things, well, you know, it's just part of things that are happening in a war that's supposed to maybe happen in a war, but not realizing that it's affecting personally us, you know. But from then on, yes, I just started affecting personally. So when you went in and saw what they'd done to the house, what had they done to your room? Well, they just went through certain drawers, and I don't know what they were looking for, just messing it up. And um, they didn't take long. The whole thing maybe lasted like maybe an hour. They didn't stay too long. And then my father just had to turn over the keys from the car. And um, they talked to them. They sent me out. So I really don't remember the conversation of anything. <coughs> And I stood with the maid outside in the kitchen. Then and, uh, and we started cleaning up the apartment. And my mother only said, well, I hope they never come back again. Were you instructed by your parents to start behaving differently in any way? Not at that time. Because I still um, was having an un-Jewish friends and anything. Later on, yes, my mother absolutely told me, um, do not visit your non-Jewish friends again, and vice versa. They were told also not to visit with me. So we had back balconies from the kitchen. We had the front part of the house and the back balconies. And there was a girl that I used to be very close with in the next house, and we could uh, wave to each other from the balcony. So in the morning, when nobody saw us, we kind of looked at each other and waved. We children didn't understand what was going on. You know, so Did you ever I would say children later on realized that that they have to tell on people, on their neighbors when they don't do certain things. Once they started going to these German youth groups and they were being trained and uh, uh, you know the Hitler Jugend and so on, uh, that's where they were being drilled what uh, these children should do or shouldn't do against us. You know. Were you personally affected by those actions? Yes, because I lost my friends during the time, and I missed them. And um, uh, other children who knew that I was Jewish, you know, they on the street they went and spit and things like that. And there was this one little girl especially. Uh, she read it one time uh, on the corner of the street, and we used to have uh, like uh, backpacks, you know, on, on our back with our uh, school things in it. And she wanted to tear it down on me and uh, just um, take everything out from the bag and just just being naughty, you know. But um, so I just put my things back in and kept going, you know. Yes, um, you felt isolated very much so. There was an isolation where once I started going to the Hebrew um, Reforms Gymnasium, then we had, like, instead of exercise, because it was winter time, we had ice skating. And a boy, just for fun, uh, a Jewish boy, took a hockey stick and hooked my leg, and I broke my leg. Well, coming into the hospital, they had to put me in a room, but I was not allowed to see the other patients. Then they had to put the um, dividers all around me, so I will be isolated that I won't see the other patients. And that's how I was in the hospital approximately for two and a half weeks. Were your parents able to come and visit you? Yes, my parents were able to come and visit me at certain hours. So, yeah, from then on it was very noticeable, you know. And then that's when your parents started talking to me about it. And uh, they themselves were flabbergasted. They themselves didn't realize what was really going to happen, you know. And we were the first ones who were put in a concentration camp from the whole family. We were the second transport out of Brno. Let's go back a little bit before that. When things started happening, all the restrictions began. Mm -hmm. Can you recall the first time you had to wear the, st the star? Oh, 
uh, yeah, we had to go line up to pick up stars. And uh, they were not, um, uh, they were just on a sheet of material pre-printed. And we had to put backing to them because you had to change the star when you changed clothing. So you, you didn't want to ruin the star itself that you just used pins. <coughs> or if you had more stars, that they, they started giving everybody two stars. But later on, you could get uh, more. Or when people left, they left the stars behind. So, so you made deals to get those extra stars so you don't have to change constantly from dress to dress, you know, because you had a star on your coat. And uh, then in case you take your coat off, you needed a star then too on your dress, you know. So um, people used to sew the, the backing onto them so that you could pin them with safety pins in the back of it, you know, just the material, not the star itself. Do you recall the first day you ever wore a star? I don't know the exact date. I don't know, but yes, and uh, I was scared to wear a star because um, that meant I could never walk again with my friends or anything like that, with my non-Jewish friends. And they could never walk with me because they never wanted to be seen with a girl who wears a star. You know. <coughs> Um, yeah, I felt sorry for myself, and uh, I couldn't understand why I, why this has to happen. And uh, thinking back now, you know, I ne never really realized. Uh, I never thought much about it, but now that I think about it, I was scared to go out in the evenings. And um, so I, I had to be home by 8 o'clock anyway. But I don't think I went out after 6 o'clock or so from that moment on. I don't know why. One time we had a maid, a new one. And uh, she lived uh, not too far from Brno. But you had to go by train. And I remember she sneaked me. And we took the star off. And I went with her to visit her parents. And the train was late, and I, Jewish people were not allowed to be out after 8 o'clock. And I remember I was watching the clock and watching the clock, and I was not allowed to be on the train. And just at the time when the conductor was supposed to come and check the ticket, she sent me to the toilet and said, lock yourself up there. I'll, I'll knock on the door when the guy is past you, you know. And that's what I remember. And, but she was watching for me, and, and I did go visit her parents. And she wanted me to, she felt sorry for me. And then she had to leave. She was not allowed to work for us no more. So Christina was her name. What other uh, things began to happen that influenced you personally that you remember? Well, uh, the exercise group fell apart. You know, the Maccabi group it was not allowed, not permitted. And later on, um, after a while, uh, the Jewish school where we all were put in, you know, to study, they closed the school. And we had to study seven children in private homes with a, an elderly student. And that's until you went to a, into a concentration camp. And that was dangerous because, like, in people were watching who goes upstairs and downstairs in, into the apartment. And so you were scared if more children come at the same time, if they uh, if anybody is going to tell on you, you know. and uh, So you're, you were scared of your neighbors because your neighbors were Germans at the time. How were you getting news at this time? Well, there were, we didn't have television or anything like that, so there was newspaper and radio. And eventually you had to give up the radio, so then you had nothing, you know. So it was just word of mouth or people talking. We still had a telephone, but not many people owned telephones at the time. You know, that was just a business phone. And um, uh, you could own a portable little phone, but the different, you, it still needed to go into the electricity. But for each f um, uh, radio, that's what I mean, radio, for each radio, you had to pay duty, you know, um, government duty you had to pay. 
And so they ha knew exactly if you had one or more radios in your own home. And then eventually had to give that up too. So communication was not too good. You mentioned that a ghetto was formed in your town. Did you yeah. have to move at that point no, as well? No, I never had to move into the ghetto. Did you have to? My grandparents lived in it, yes. They had to leave the place where they lived and had to move in there, and my uncle and aunt and so on. It was, uh, they took like maybe four or five streets and this way and then deep inside and that was the ghetto then. Were you able to visit them? Absolutely, yes. Yes, and it was very sad to look at it because they could not take all the furniture and nothing, so they just took a mattress and uh, a couple of suitcases and that's how they lived. Uh, nails on the wall and, and petitions between the families, you know. It was a very sad situation. How often would you go visit? Uh, that's where my friends were, so very often. You know, that's where my friends were, because not many lived where I did. Not, not, not Jewish people anymore. Anybody mm, had to move out except us. Did that cause guilt? No, on the contrary, I invited children to us, and my mother always had big pots of soups and everything, and we tried to help children, and especially um, children that were in an orphanage home where the parents already had left and left the kids behind. You see, a lot of transports used to go illegally to Israel, but children under nine years old and not knowing how to swim, we're not permitted to go. And these children had to stay behind in an in a orphanage home. So my mother became like a big mama to a lot of these children. And if I showed you uh, the last time, in the, the two children that stayed behind and then got killed in a concentration camp where the parents lived in Israel and so on, well, that, that was one of them. And that was six years old and nine years old, or 10 years old, these children. Do you recall any specific uh, fears or nightmares you had at this time when things were changing so quickly? Yes, yes. Um, where I maybe started talking, my mother had to woke me up. What did you say? What did you say? What are you talking about? You know, where I must have said something loud because I remember my mother waking me up one time and said, what were you dreaming about? You know, so yes, I must say yes. I couldn't recall exactly what it was, but uh, I must have been frightened, yeah. What did your parents do to comfort you at this time? I slept with them in the same room. And uh, then another cousin lived with us, and then my uncle, until they moved to Slovakia, they had to leave their apartment and they lived with us too. So my mother opened Although it was a dining room and uh, a family room, they opened it up for people to stay with us because we had more room, you know. That means they were registered in the ghetto, but they stayed with us. So sleeping with your parents at night? And um, in the same room gave me maybe the comfort. Did you still have your teddy bear at this time? Yes. The teddy bear went with me to Theresienstadt and Auschwitz. What happened after, after at that point? Once well, um, one day we got a notice that we have to be in a school within three days. And uh, that was the second transport from um, Brno, not knowing where we are going. And so we were in this school, and then on the third day at night, they took us in a, put us in a tram and drove us to the train station, to the outskirt of the train station, loaded up the trains there, and then we were like two and a half days traveling back and forth, where it usually takes four hours from our hometown to Theresienstadt, and they left us out in I believe that's where it was. And then we had, at that time, the train did not go into Theresienstadt yet. They, that was built later, and we had to walk into Theresienstadt. And there were only two barracks um, 
occupied. And that was the Sudeten barrack that was for men and the Dresden barrack for women. So as we entered Theresienstadt, we were separated from my father. And at that time, the city itself still had non-Jewish people living there. So we had to help them to be moved in, out of the city so we can prepare the city with bunk beds and things like that in private homes. In other words, these people were given beautiful Jewish homes someplace else and given jobs and whatever when they left Theresienstadt. Let's go the back people. to when you, the night, the day you left. Mm -hmm. What did you take with you? Okay, uh, we had um, two suitcases and a big bag, kind of a duffel bag. And um, due to clothing, some food, sardines, bread, uh, non-perishable items, and. Uh, uh, I remember taking a little prayer book, my mother and I, a pillow, uh, the pictures we left behind with aunt, because she was half Jewish, so we left the pictures with her. Um, and we gave the sewing machine to the people who used to take care of the, <laughs> the, uh, the house, you know, the apartment house. And everything else we left behind, just just left it behind, furniture and everything. There was no way you could sell it, or mm, I mean that was already like saying you have to leave it behind. It was confiscated. The Germans already owned it by then, you know. So you were not allowed to dispose of it. If you had any rugs or dishes or fancy uh, crystal or anything like that, that was, you know, that was understood that you're not going to take this. So, Can you recall which specific clothes or I'd personal items you packed for yourself? Um, shoes. I wanted to be sure that it has double soles, that in case I cannot have it sold. <laughs> I was scared that, because I was always a big walker and so on. So the minute I found out that I'm going to be put in a concentration camp, I remember I took the shoes and had, had them double sold. And um, I thought if I had put in my boots, I had put a zipper that I sewed in myself from the inside, and I thought if I take a couple of marks with me, that's going to save me, or maybe that I can pay off somebody, but it didn't. <laughs> and um, coat, because it was winter time, you know, so you had to, had to take warm clothes. And I remember that I put on a lot of clothing, so I don't have to carry it, you know. So we, um, uh, I remember putting sweaters on and uh, dresses, and then even underneath I had a pair of pants. But then, going from, going into the school, I, I didn't dress up like that. That was from the school not knowing if we're going to keep our luggage and so on. Going to the school, I just had like a pant uh, skirt, a blouse, a sweater, coat, and boots. We have to change tapes. Yeah. I was notified that you had to leave your home mm -hmm. in Bruno. Who went with you when you left? My mother, my father, and me. And we had the first numbers. K3, I had K3, K3. My mother had K4, and my father had K5. So we always, when we had to line up, we had to be in the first row, not knowing what's going to happen to us. So that was scary. What did your mom and dad tell you was happening then? They didn't know themselves. They did not know. We did not know where we are going. Nobody told us we're going to be winding up in Theresienstadt. And we knew that the transports were going from other city to Poland. And that's what we were scared, because we used to send packages to Poland, uh, two-pound packages before, where people found out our name, and uh, especially those that already had left from Austria and Germany. 
they, uh, somebody gave him our name, and so my mother used to send packages, and she says, oh my God, I hope we're not going to wind up in the same places like these poor people, you know, and so she was kind of worried, what is she going to do in case I'm going to be hungry, what does the mother say to a child, you know, and things like that. How old were you at this point? Well, uh, I was uh, not quite 13. Let's see, 13, yeah, 13. I just passed 13. Okay. Describe what happened from the time you got to the school mm -hmm. and arrived. Okay, in the school, in the classroom, the, the classrooms were emptied and we slept on the floor. And so they had like 30 people laying in, in each classroom. And um, they came with big catches like military food, whatever you want to call it, and uh, we all had to have um, our canteens, you know, where they poured the food into it, and uh, so that's how they fed us, which was not too bad at the time, those three days there, but we were not allowed to leave the school or anything like that. What was the food? You know, I don't remember exactly. I know it was kind of a soupy type of thing. A th thick soup and with a piece of bread or something, but what it was exactly, I can't tell you. It just like a dream. <laughs> and then you were and at the school. We were at the school, and then like the third day during the night, we had to leave, and we were put on the like a trolley that took us straight to the train station. And I remember we passed our house and. That's when we had tears in our eyes because we said, well, I wonder if we ever going to be back here. And we never were back there anymore. That was the last time I waved to, to the house. And we arrived there. And uh, there was a lot of SS people already waiting at the train station and trying to load us up. And uh, at that time, we still had trains with cover. So they were not the trains that didn't have uh, no cover, you know, those animal uh, wagons, I would say. So we were covered at that time. Describe the inside of the train you were in. Um, I remember that there were some seats there, but not seating like uh, regular train seating. They were just benches and people were putting stuff under the benches or between, you know, the, their belongings and things like that. So it was just a couple of benches I think they put into each wagon. It was a regular, um, n not, not for, um, I don't know why you want to say that. Uh, it was not a regular public uh, train. It was a train for shipping things. You know. Where did you sit? People didn't sit all the time because there was no room. <laughs> so some people sat, some people sat on the floor, some people sat on their luggage, some people wherever, you know. And we alternated. We alternated. And uh, there was a bucket that you could go mm, into the bathroom. And like at a couple of train stations, they opened the door and took the buckets out, and then they gave us different buckets again. So at that time, it still was hygienic. Uh, that's the first time you felt um, a little bit embarrassed because you were with men together. And uh, I never went before to the toilet without, uh, uh, you know, having my privacy. So that was a little bit embarrassing. How many days were you on the train? Like two and a half, three days altogether. What did you eat? Mm, they gave us a package, bread and uh, um, I don't remember exactly what it was, some kind of a cheese or something. They gave us a package to, to last us for those couple of days, you know. And then we had our own. We had the sardines and we had things that we brought from home. We were told that we can bring some things. So it, 
food-wise, I don't think anybody was very hungry. I think we were more scared than anything else. And uh, they did during the night, as we stopped at different train stations, yes, they did uh, gave us like a pitcher of water, or I think they even served us coffee, warm coffee, if I'm not mistaken. There was something being served, I remember that, that they brought I as, a, in a, as a pitcher, you know, into the wagon. Describe your first view of Terezin. Well, I saw a lot of barracks, and I seen a normal little city where people are still walking. You know, the non-Jewish people, they had their businesses there, and they had their, their school there and everything, and um, it looked like another little village. And I didn't know what to expect from going into, um, uh, into the Dresdner Caserne, into the Dresdner Barrack. And when we arrived there, we were put like um, 38 people into one room without any bunk beds or anything because we just uh, slept on our own luggage. <laughs> and uh, we were handed later on, like a week later, we were handed one piece of a mat. Now, you realize in Europe, uh, the beds don't have one long big mattress. They are divided in three pieces. So we just got a small piece, you know, that one piece of a piece of mattress. And that was being taken away like a year later because they were scared of um, bug beds, you know, those uh, um, bed bugs and all that stuff. And they had straw mattresses. So everything was exchanged for straw mattresses later on. When you first arrived, describe the routine that you went through to get into the barracks. Um, when we arrived, we were separated by the train station, men and women. And we had to go straight, follow the SS, wherever was marching with us. And uh, we arrived in this big, big barrack. And there were some people already there. And um, the first day, they fed us cooked, very dirty potatoes that were not peeled. And my mother screamed. and went to the German that time, not realizing that she can even get hurt or something. And she said, what are you doing? Do you want to have an epidemic here? And you know, an epidemic not only will kill the people that are um, uh, being in a concentration camp, but also the overseers might pick up the epidemic from them. She said, would you please give us hygiene and let us peel the potatoes and cook them properly and so on? And she says, well, if you have knives and you want to peel them, that's fine. And my mother volunteered that time. And there was approximately 500 people there in that barrack, although that barrack could hold over 3,000. And I remember she said to me, Ruthie, come with me. We're going to peel potatoes. And my mother got like five other ladies and said, because we will never be hungry, we can always wash the peels and we can eat the peels. I mean, that was her her uh, philosophy and uh, the German then, uh, there was a cook, there were two cooks there and um, they were quite mean, although they were Jewish, they, they took it upon themselves to be very rough, you know, and um, they didn't like the idea of my mother wanting to have a clean kitchen and clean everything, but my mother talked to the German overseer at that time and he hired her to be in that kitchen. So then later on, they opened up another kitchen upstairs because more people came in. So my mother became for the, the downstairs kitchen in charge. And that was a big help to us. That was really a big help to my father and to me and to my family because if there was anything left over, at least we had a chance of getting it. You know. Did you have contact with your father? Yes. How? Um, my father stayed until 1943, I believe, the end of 43. He was uh, separated from us. Until then, he was in this in this infection and um, working uh, um, again, bad, bad bugs or people that came with lice, you know, and things like that. So that was his job in this infection. And uh, he, we saw him 
after his work almost every evening. Were you still in barracks or were you? Oh, that was during the time we were in barracks. No, we did not see him. That was after Theresienstadt was clear of non Jewish people. Do and it was opened, and then you could walk through the city and you could visit with each other after work. And did you move to a different, out of the barracks no, to a different no, place? No, no, we stayed where we were. My father moved, yes, into a little um, house where instead of like uh, 30 people in a room, then there was like five people in a room. And the disinfection department had their own building. You know? I forgot to ask you, when, <coughs> when did you arrive in Terzing? Well, let me give you the exact... Uh, <laughs> um, well, it was uh, in the end of 19... Um, uh, that's right, 1941. Okay, so you arrived in 1941. That's right. And your mom immediately got the job in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And I did all kind of other jobs in the meantime. I helped peel potatoes. I was dis distributing mattresses as new people came in. Um, I was sweeping the corridors. I tried to keep busy, always, because uh, the people that were not being needed, these, are, these were the people that were put on the lists and being shipped out. So I tried, and then I started working for the children's gardens. That was uh, greenery for the Germans. Could you describe the children's gardens in detail? Yes. Um, they had a big fence all around Theresienstadt. And this big fence was very, very wide. And on top of it, it grew trees and on top of this fence. Now behind that was water all around. But we developed and made gardens on top of this fence and uh, raised carrots and radishes and vegetables, uh, easy vegetables for the Germans, you know. And believe me, they came by and they knew exactly what's there and God forbid you ate one carrot, they would have known it. So you so never tried stealing? Oh, no, 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 no. I only did one time one thing. There were these beautiful apple orchards and they had gorgeous apples. And believe me, that this one SS man, he came by, he counted apples and wanted to be sure that none of us can have an apple. And we were told that if an apple falls down and is, and is bad, that we can share it. And so with my tush, I bumped into that tree and I was hoping that something might fall down and I was being watched by the German at the time. So I had to st stay home for a couple of days. Uh, like a punishment. Uh, that was my punishment. So it wasn't so bad. That's the punishment the SS gave, gave me? Gave me, right, that I was not allowed to go to work, to work for a couple of days. What other type of interaction did you have with the SS during the times you were in Terezin? And not in Terezin, the only time when they had a big appeal when, uh, um, you know, Heinrich got killed and they wanted to kill us all at the same time. And they, um, at five o'clock in the morning, we had to march on a big, big, big field. And all, all Theresienstadt, I mean, all the people from Theresienstadt had to march there. And we had to stand all day long. And what saved us was a Catholic priest accidentally walked by. And he said, what's going on? And he went and spilled the beans that this is what they are playing. They were, they were ready to kill us then. You know, that was the time when Ligitze also uh, was blown up the whole city and so on. And they wanted to get rid of uh, all the people in Theresienstadt. But it was this, I understand, later on, that's how we found out, later on after the war, it was this priest who saved us. And then late at night, we, were, we walked back into Theresienstadt. But um, yes, they had military and SS people and everybody. Uh, walking us and watching us, and we had to stand in, in rows of fives. And that was scary that time. And that time they didn't feed us anything. And they had no toilets for us, nothing. <laughs> where did you go to the bathroom? Well, we just went right there and where we were, standing in the rows, where we kind of um, 
you know, a few girls were holding circle and the person went. Because we were separated from the men, you know, so it was not such a big thing. So. At that time, were you affected as a young 13, 14 year old girl just starting to mature? Did that, um, the, yes. the diet upset your balance and your yes, maturity? Yes, that was my menstruation. And surprisingly, I got it back the day I left Auschwitz going into Erdogan, almost a year. And then after the war, I had to get injections back because I grew tall, but my insides didn't grow exactly. So I had to have some dilatations made and so on. Talking about hygienic things. And I lost a lot of calcium from my body and that affected my teeth. And I had eight surgeries in my mouth after the war where they put um, uh, s uh, silver platings in some of my bone structures just to hold the teeth in perfect and uh, stuff like that. What was a typical meal during those that time? Well, um, in the morning we had coffee and bread. And uh, in for lunch you had maybe a potato and a gravy. And maybe once a week you had horse meat, or twice a week maybe you had horse meat. And it smelled, and I couldn't eat it. And sometimes they cooked it in the soup, sometimes they baked it, whatever they did to it, I don't know. And sometimes I disliked it because it smelled horrible. And um, even soups they made out of bones, horse bones, you know. These were old horses probably that got killed on the boulevard. <laughs> no, the diet was not good. But thank God uh, between my mother and uh, she always put a little something aside that I had, you know, from the, either the day before. And o yeah, occasionally we get a dumpling, a plain white dumpling, nothing with it. That was, that was good. <laughs> what types of social or cultural things did you get involved in there mm. while you were terrorizing? With my friends in my age group. Now, I slept and I stayed in Theresienstadt in the Dresdner Barrack with my mother. And then we got into a smaller hallway that we partitioned and made it into a room for five people. But all the other children had to go, what they call L14, the Czech, Czech uh, children. The German children then went to uh, L410 and so on. And then they had a boys' uh, uh, school where the boys were housed and so on. And the children were separated from the parents. And I used to go to L14 after my work, and that's when I socialized with my friends my age. And um, it was, um, we didn't have any books of any kind, but we studied Hebrew from one another, you know, from the o older children. Or uh, if somebody sneaked in, and, or f there was a library, Theresienstadt had a library where as people died and so on, and they left some books, these books were collected, and their clothing was collected, and you could get money, Czechoslovakian, I mean, I would say, Theresienstadt money, and you could go into a shop which had used clothing from people that died or that they took it away from, and this is the stuff that you could buy. You could never buy anything new or anything, you know, but that was the type of uh, exchange, and you got so much <coughs> money per year which was nothing. So you could maybe buy one thing. That was it, you know. Can you recall what you bought ever? Um, I think I even gave it to my mother. I don't ever remember buying anything because my papa's cousin, Herta, she died on typhoid in Theresienstadt. She worked in the place where they um, sorted things. And in case I needed sometimes something, she put it on, and then she took it off and gave it to me. <laughs> so. Mm. How were holidays celebrated in Terezin? Like any other day, except those that were observant, uh, met in a large um, room downstairs in, in the barrack, in the Dresdner barrack. And there was um, 
a woman, a German woman who was a woman rabbi, uh, reformed. And her name was Kahane. And this woman was a dream. She knew every prayer by heart, like when Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, she conducted her own little service. And those who wanted to, either before work or after work, could go and pray with her. Uh, no, we didn't get any matzah, so my mother stole flour and uh, made a little paddy with flour and water and we would write it on the windowsill. And so everybody had a taste. Um, yes, we were aware of holidays and you cooked and you talked about what you were doing in your, with your friends and that's how you celebrated and maybe sang a few songs especially this younger group that youth group that I belong they we learned a lot of songs a lot of poetry we recited a lot of things to keep our mind and uh, open to knowledge and so on because just to do what they wanted you to do the Germans believe me you could go crazy so you needed some cultural events. So we had competitions in, in um, poetry, and I won, or so on, uh, because I was fell in love with Rachel Bluchstein and Bialik, and I chose some of the poetry, and then I recited, and I won from the poetry and that, and I loved it. And um, although I didn't know much Hebrew, but I learned it there. Can you recall the poem that mm -hmm. you said? It was uh, the childless. And uh, it started out Ben du Hayal, Yalet Katan, Shahor Tal Talim Venavon, the Echot Biado, Vilipshualekan, and so on and so on. It was just beautiful. It's about a dream that Hannah had um, when she was in Shiva. And uh, she dreams of this little boy who has curly hair, and she takes him through the garden and she holds him. And she wa never could have a child, and this is her dream of this child that she could never have. And I fell in love with that poem. <laughs> and then there was another one from Bialik, I remember. I am the home, Sha'on Taraj, Alp Neme Mav, Dalia Nasaat, Aha Dalia, and At and so on. <laughs> and that is about a little bird that is sitting on a branch and he and the branch is falling into the little river and the branch is uh, floating and all of a sudden it gets stuck on a side of the of um, the riverbed there and uh, this bird gets up and he starts flying off again. It was pretty. <laughs> How were you taken care of if you were sick when you were there? Okay, there we had doctors there, and uh, I even had I had a big problem at one time where I had impetigo, which is um, like pussy little bumps, and the impetigo can go inwardly, and that is um, very painful, and they had to cut this open and had to have it drained, and. Um, that was just at the time when my father left for Auschwitz, not knowing that he's going to go to Auschwitz. Um, they had aspirin. Then they had this red lotion, like a tincture of something, that they put on, you know, for disinfection. <coughs> but um, no, they didn't have any antibiotics, and they didn't have any. Uh, s they performed surgeries. Uh, in another building, which was the hospital, but uh, you seldom got out of there. Once you were in that building, then you know. Then there was another building with infections that had the typhoid, the encephalitis, uh, the elongitis, and so on. Then that was a separate building again. You know. And uh, usually you never got out of that building either. That means there was not much hope because you didn't have the medication. You know, they just separated you. But they didn't treat it, you with anything. How did you personally deal with the stress you were under? 
you know, you become very apathic that you say, please God, let it be and let it tomorrow, it should be over. And you hope, especially as a young child, you don't, all of a sudden you don't hear nothing about politics. Nobody gives you any newspapers. Nobody gives you radios to hear. So you really don't know what is going on the outside. Unless uh, you are in some kind of an underground that uh, some overseer tells you something, you know, and then the rumor flies really fast. So you really don't get involved in the political issue of things, and you just hope that tomorrow it should be over, and you are living for one thing, revenge. Especially, that's all we wanted to do, just kick somebody's behind if, we, if the war is over. And believe me, I had my kick. <laughs> Who would you talk to about this wanting this revenge? Um, this, my friends, we were talking about it. We said, so what are we going to do if this is ever over? How, what right do these people have to lock us up like this and to do this to us? And, and this is supposed to be the, quote, intelligent uh, you know, group of people who have education and everything. Because if you really consider, now at, I'm talking now even Auschwitz and so on, who developed the cyclone? I mean, these were chemists people who used to go to university, who designed a concentration camp, an architect, again, an educated person. So who did the um, uh, medical research on twins and things like that? A guy who, went, who was a doctor who went to the university. Now, these were all intelligent people. It wasn't a farmer. It wasn't a, a, a worker from a um, factory. So it means it, this was the high intelligence who developed this kind of an atmosphere. So, Jumping ahead, you said you did get revenge. How? Well, after the war, all the Germans were um, gathered, and they had to leave Czechoslovakia. And I remember in Theresa, and I was not allowed to get out because I was in the typhoid quarantine that time. So we ran out, and as one of these transports went by, a couple of us, we ran out, and we just kicked them. That's it. <laughs> no, I never had revenge of killing anybody. No, this this not. I never believe, I never will own a gun, and I still don't own a gun, and I don't believe. I say, if God wants me to die, then he'll make sure that I'll die. But. I will not contribute by fighting over something like that. And I never had the urge to kill anybody. No, this not. This not. Let's go back to Terezine. <coughs> we have to change tapes. What, 25, 26? So you have the experience. But they've interviewed 60,000 of them. Oh, are we on? Oh. Let's go back to Terezine while you, you were still there. When you think back, what memory just stands out the most about that time? The friendships that I made. The support we gave each other. Um, those that survived and still can talk about it, we are closer than a brother and a sister. And we stay in touch with each other. And I think for me to overcome any little problem, this was the most important thing to me. The support that we gave each other. Either in one of the, uh, my friends, the parents left, or the father left, or the mother left, and uh, the child felt alone, or like in my case, when my dad left, the friends that I had that supported me to overcome this, I believe this was the most important thing to me. How and I had friends, uh, not only girls, but uh, I didn't have any boyfriends that I dated or had affairs with or anything like that. But the friendships that we developed as 
friends, boys and girls. That is, that was unbelievable, you know, how we cared for each other. Um, then I believe I also mentioned to you that I joined a group called Yato Mehet, the Helping Hand, where we gave outreach to elderly people and those that were sick, that we went into the rooms, and those that were bedridden, we changed their and loosened up their straw mattresses, tried to give them a little bit extra food when we had it, and um, washed their clothes. They couldn't get up no more and do it. And uh, when they were put into a transport, especially the elderly, they always got rid of those first, and the people that were crazy and, and or, um, we try to help these people, and maybe as a group that try to have this group that try to help, that was like an outlet for us where we helped each other too, you know. So we, we felt good by doing something good. You said your friends <coughs> just gave you a lot of support when yes. your father left. Can you yes. describe to me what kind of support? Um, they came and visited with me in the evening because I was just after this little surgery that I had, and I was kind of feeling low uh, because I had this impetigo that needed surgery. And uh, I couldn't go to work at the time. And very soon afterwards, I would say, um, at the end of the year then, I was put into the concentration camp to go to Auschwitz, you know. So, but in this time in between, a lot of them also left and were put into uh, to Auschwitz before me. And, uh, but, for example, we um, tried to help each other when we were packing and leaving. So if another friend left, I helped him, and then they helped me when I was leaving again, you know. So it was um, understood that we are here for each other. But mostly, just coming and getting together and talking. That was the main thing, because that's all we had left. Um, did I see anybody commit suicide? Yes. Did I see people jumping from the upstairs uh, when they were desperate? Yes. Um, did I know somebody like that? Yes. Who? There was a young girl that I befriended. Uh, she was from Holland. And um, she was living then in Germany. She came to Theresienstadt, and just a couple of weeks before, her parents were taken away. And she was all by herself. And uh, one day in the morning, I'm going for my breakfast coffee, and all of a sudden, I hear boom. And sure enough, right next to where we were standing, she jumped from the second floor. And uh, I found out later on who she was, and uh, I didn't even look, you know, at the time. But um, yes, the same thing happened in Auschwitz, where they had the electric uh, wirings. You know. My mother was ready to run, and unless I would have stopped. Uh, so we kind of uh, the mental support that you you need a group whom you can give mental support and who can give you the mental support. So it works both ways, you know. And I would say that people who did not have this, they, I am sure, suffered more loneliness, um, scariness, depression, and so on. Describe the day your father left. Um, I just came back from having my little surgery, and uh, my mother said that she was scared to tell me that Dad was put into this uh, um, transport, and he had to be ready within two days. And I remember I bandaged my leg, and uh, I went over to my dad and tried to help him pack. And my mother was trying to get as much food that she could and give it to him so he can have it on the way. Uh, Dad was very scared. By that time, his parents were gone already. His brothers were gone. His nephews, everybody were gone. And he signed a slip that he is going to go into another 
working camp to prepare the barracks. So that, and then he will come back. But in the meantime, he wound up in Auschwitz. We didn't know that. So we were not scared. You know, we thought, well, either we're going to join him someday or that he's going to come back anyway. So we had no idea that this is permanent. So we um, said goodbye to Daddy and... Uh, Do you remember when that was? Mm, I can look it up the date exactly. I have it... Uh, if you give me this photo, I have it right in there. That's all right. We can look it up later. Yeah. <coughs> did, how did your life change after your dad left? Um, there was not much change because I kept on working. My, my mother was working, and um, by that time, all the relatives were gone already, except my mother's sister and uh, the niece, Dita and Tante Elfie. And um, so we were hoping that someday we would join them. And with this imagination, we kept going, you know. And sure enough, my aunt was put into the, into the transport, and my mother and I, we volunteered and joined, not realizing we wind up in Auschwitz. And my mother signed a slip that she is going to go and meet Daddy at this working camp. And my father was not there. When was this? Well, that was the end of uh, 1944. The next to the last transport from Theresienstadt. If we could have waited one more transport, then that was the last transport that left Theresienstadt. So describe that trip. That trip, we were put into... Um, First of all, what did you take with you? Oh, we were very a little allowed to take. We were allowed to take only two suitcases, and I think it was like 20, 20 kilos or something like that. So a lot of stuff that we brought originally from um, Brno to Theresienstadt, we had to leave behind. And um, you could only have like a knapsack to put your food in. And again, um, these old cans, <laughs> probably they were two, three years old already. Some of those sardines and all that stuff that we originally brought and saved just for those days. That's the stuff we took again and then we had to leave it in Auschwitz in the wagon anyway, so it didn't do us any good. Um, not realizing that we are going to arrive in Auschwitz, we looked forward meeting my father in this other camp, which we have never met. You know. So we were not afraid. And we always thought, well, after we do our work there at that working camp, we're going to come back to Theresienstadt. That's what we thought. How so stupid we were. <coughs> what did you personally take with you? What I took with me, mostly again, it was winter time, closing, and some food. And um, again, my boots that I brought with me from home, where I had my little zipper in it, and I thought if I put a little money still was in there, and I thought this was going to help me, but it didn't, want because then I had to take my boots off in Auschwitz, and there are some place there, in that big, big heap of shoes. And um, um, there was not much, that because by that time you didn't have... I remember my mother had a little bit of urn from her mother when she was cremated, and she was hoping that she can bury that someday. But the rest of the, of the urn, the rest of the uh, cremation material was thrown into the river. So we have absolutely no knowledge where grandma is, you know. Was your teddy bear still with you? Yeah, my teddy bear still was with me, and he went with me to Auschwitz. Did he have a name? Not that I think of. I think my little teddy. <laughs> not, not specially, no. My teddy. I used to call him teddy. Did you use him to talk to, to try to work out your stress to sleep with. and comfort? To sleep with and have be comfortable with. And uh, if I can tell you a little story, I had my first little surgery when I came to the to United States. And um, as I wake up from my anesthetic, my husband brought me a teddy bear and he laid next to me. 
<laughs> so you left. I can tell you another story about this ring, too. I had, um, as a child, my grandparents gave me a little ring with my initials, plain gold ring. I had to give that up. All the gold had to be given up. So here was my ring that I had to give up. And in Theresienstadt itself, my mother had one made out of plain metal, again with my initials for my birthday. That ring I had to give up in Auschwitz. So I didn't have my ring again. So on my 60th birthday, my husband says to me, what would you like for your birthday? And I said, Kurt, if I could just get a plain little gold ring with my old initials to put on my little pinky, I would be the happiest girl. Well, I, we went to Benjamin's and uh, we ordered uh, the ring. And the man says to me, but you need to come back for sizing to make sure that it fits. And I come and it was just plain like a square and he didn't have the initial in it yet, nothing. And so I fit it, and I said, that's fine. And when I came to pick it up, it had all diamonds in it. And it has my initials. OK, <laughs> okay let's go back to when you left Terezin. Mm. Describe the trip. Uh, the trip was uh, a couple of days again. And they were shoving us back. And I mean, we did, had no idea where we are going. Absolutely not. At one time, we were very close to Auschwitz, and they put us back again and drove us who knows where. And um, uh, so we re it was open, wag you know, those open wagons. So we really didn't, no, wait a minute. This time, we didn't have the open wagons. We had the closed wagons. And we really didn't know which directions, because they were going during the night this way and then back again. And so it was like two and a half days, which usually takes maybe half a day to go from Theresienstadt to Auschwitz there. But finally, um, we arrived. And mm, some wor Jewish workers that had to clean the wagons from the spills and from people, you know. Um, they came, and one recognized my mother, because he was to be in Theresienstadt. And he said to my mother, you make yourself older, and your daughter has to make herself, uh, I mean, you make yourself younger, and your daughter has to make herself older. Because anybody above 18 and anybody below 38 will go into a working camp. But anybody below 18, anybody above 38 can go and be, uh, go to gas chambers. Well, we had no idea that they had gas chambers there, and that they had, uh, you know, uh, things like that. So we didn't even believe it. And all of a sudden, the second, third day, all of a sudden we saw smoke. That's when we realized, hey, we are pretty close to what the man was talking to us, you know. So um, on the way from Theresienstadt to Auschwitz, we had no idea where we were going to be going. And we were looking forward to m go into the working camp where my father is going to be not realizing that there was not another thing like that. So we were not scared, no. And uh, whatever, you know, we were before in a wagon, so we just have to be in a wagon and just have to, um, hopefully it won't last long, you know. You become very non-caring, very non-caring. You don't think what, you know, like 20 years later now after the war, you think, my God, what did I go through that I even could stand it? It it dawns on you, but at that time it didn't dawn on me. I don't know why, because I was so. We we seen so much, we went through so much, that we just lived for the day that it's over. No matter what we have to go through, because you had no choice. What could you do? We couldn't fight back. We didn't have guns. We didn't have nothing. You know, they had everything, and we had nothing. So, well, anyway, we arrived in Auschwitz. We had to leave the wagons, and uh, that's when we met the famous Mengele, Dr. Mengele, for the first time. 
a good looking guy with a baton like and he only looked at you smilingly and some of us some of them he asked how old you are some of them he didn't ask and uh, he divided you right in and there and not realizing who is going to go where why or why you are being divided and so on so at that time there was 200 women from that particular transport of thousand that were chosen now there were some men uh, also that were chosen I think a hundred men if I'm not mistaken but women were 200 from the thousand people that were chosen to go on the good side the rest of them went on the bad side M mothers with children elderly people people who um, maybe needed a cane or things like that or <laughs> some of them couldn't get out of the wagon because they were so sick they just had taken off the wagons right then and there you know and um, so our luck was that we were taken onto the good side not realizing that you are being uh, chosen already you found that out later well when we came to this big big hall we had to undress there and who showed up was Dr. Mengele again and uh, so you were shaved completely your hair your underarms your below and um, what they did they had low benches and you had to spread your feet and you walked through the benches and these women were laying there or men and they had shavers and shaved you and then they poured petroleum over you as a disinfection which burned like hell so you had no hair. You, I didn't recognize my mother. I ran to another lady because I thought that was my mother too. And there was two ladies, this other lady, Mrs. Lachman, and my mother. They looked very similar, and they later on were taken for twins, and uh, they worked both in the kitchen in Theresien in Erdogan, and they both survived. And I'm still in touch with the daughters from this lady. Uh, they live in Australia today. Do you think the shaving experience affected your life in any way Absolutely. as an older? In what Absolutely. ways would you? Because I was very um, private, always very private. And uh, here you stand in front of so many hundred people, and uh, you have absolutely no privacy to yourself. And you were thinking, who are these people who, who gave them the right to do this to you? You know, what rights do they have? And you like to fight back, but you can't, because you are naked. And a human being that has no clothing, even Adam and Eve had a fig leaf. But in this case, you had nothing. So um, you are being stripped completely of your feelings, of your more or less your, your dignity and everything. And after they shaved you, what happened? After they shaved us, they, we had to stand in a big room, in this big room, on a cement floor, no benches, no nothing, sit on the floor there, and they gave us a dress. This was winter time. They gave us a summer dress fr that they took away from other people. It was not a uniform, it was not a striped thing, it was a dress. No underwear. And that's, and we got like a pair of shoes, I believe, but no socks. And again, it was an old pair of shoes that they took away from before. They had a big linen closet there, but that was behind the virus and the Germans were watching it so nobody can steal clothing there or steal linen there to, to get warm you know for the clothes and the shoes would they give you just any size okay they had like you you they had like three sizes and once you passed this person who divided you you know after Mengele then she guided you. You go into this line, you go into this line, you go into this line. And this is the clothes that you received. So it was hanging on me. It was big on me. But at least I could put it over, 
you know. But there was no underwear, no brassiers, nothing like that, no socks, nothing. And in this condition, we were put into the sea lager, and which is the barrack of Auschwitz. And there we s went like for three days, and we, all we had to do is stand appeals, go to the latrines, and uh, get our soup and so on, but we didn't work. And one day, uh, Mengele came again, I went six times through him, to our barrack, and started choosing people for uh, transport uh, to work. And they, they needed a thousand people and, uh, to fill up the, the train. And thank God that I was in the same row as my mother, because the row next to us wound up in Bergen-Belsen and I wound up in Erdogan. That means the wagons were going through cities, and whichever city um, needed people either to kill them as soon as possible, you know, that they had gas chambers. So we were transferred from um, Auschwitz under the jurisdiction of Flossenburg, which Erdogan was under the jurisdiction from. That's why I did not, the last two transport did not get tattooed no more in Auschwitz. Then because Auschwitz was liberated then in January. And see, we didn't know that. Okay. Couldn't we have waited another couple of months? <laughs> so I was at the end of the whole thing then, you know, in Auschwitz. And so uh, we arrived in Erdogan and uh, well, let's go back to you leaving Auschwitz. Yeah. Describe that. Well, uh, that was scary, too, because um, after we had been selected on to the good side again, okay, that was already my, that was the first time, um, we were, we had to walk quite a way, and I'll be honest with you, I don't even remember where we walked. On the way, we saw a big band playing, um, beautiful music. Then we saw another woman walking, a group of women walking, and uh, then we were put into this room. And uh, the showers, there were showers, and the people started screaming because they said these are the bad showers. This is the gas chamber. And uh, had you known about gas chambers? Well, that by that time we were told, in Auschwitz, we were told. And um, so I believe a lot of people started praying and saying Shema Israel at the time, because we didn't know what we expected. And all of a sudden we get this cold water, but so cold. And we get hot water, and cold water, and hot water, and cold water. But at least people started screaming out of happiness by then. And what they try to do is to see if you can stand this. It, because mentally, this is damaging, if, especially if water keeps on dripping. You know, if it hits your, your tip, and let's say you get drip, drip, drip cold water, and all of a sudden you get drip, drip, drip hot water, you know, and then you get a real shower, <coughs> really hot water. So they played games with us in, in regards to this shower bit. And they turned it off, and you went into another room. How long were you in the shower? Oh, at least half an hour. At least half an hour. And uh, I, I really can't tell you. It could have been more. It could have been more. And you go into this other room, and you breathe a little easier because you hope, well, this is over, you know. And, but you're not being handed any towels. You are wet completely wet. But we don't have hair, so nothing has to uh, dry on you. you know? So now you have been handed a pair of panties, another dress. Again, you have went through this dress bit. <coughs> and um, you got a coat. So my mother said, you know, we got a coat. They are planning something else with us. And sure enough, we had to line up by five and walk quite a way, and they put us into the open cattle cars then. And I always hundred in each. And so we were, um, which Erdogan is between Dresden and Hamnitz, 
and closer to the Polish border. We were traveling back and forth and back and forth. And everywhere they stopped, they dropped off a wagon. So just before we went to Erdogan, we were in Bergen-Belsen and dropped off a wagon there. And then the train kept on going, and we were dropped off in Erdogan. But we didn't know we were going to be dropped off there. So we were only hoping that wherever we are being dropped off, they shouldn't have any gas chambers or something that they kill us, that we can go and be dropped off in a working camp. That was because the war was slowly over, and the Russians and everybody was closing in, and they were trying to liquidate places, you know. So we were scared. We really were scared that they're going to get rid of us, either or they're going to shoot us right then and there. So anyway, we found up. We wound up in Erdogan, and we had to get off the train and walk past the train station on the opposite side, under the viaduct. We had to walk under supervision of dogs and 16-year-old boys, because the rest of the men were in the military. And some of the SS people that got hurt, so there was an elderly man that had no hand no more, and you know some of these SS people who got injured, so they were the overseers now. And um, we walked, and it said, Kaiserzwienfabrik. That means threat, Kaiser's threat factory. But in reality, it was an ammunition factory. And the ammunition factory didn't have enough electricity going into the factory for the heavy machinery that they needed us, another 200 women, to come in and help with laying cables and ele putting in new electricity through the streets. And the streets were all frozen because it was winter time. So I wound up in the Außenkommando, which is the out commando, and we did get uh, uniforms. And uh, my mother was the inside, working again in the kitchen. She always got herself into this. How did she get into that? And she told the lady that uh, the, uh, the German supervisor that she would, if they need anybody in the kitchen, that she has the experience of cooking for 3,000 people, which she did have from Theresienstadt. And the woman said, oh, sure, now that there's more of us, you can come right in. And that's how my mother got into it. My mother had an open mouth, and she always talked. And uh, she volunteered for the things where she could feel she could benefit from it. And I must give her credit, and that's what saved us more than anything else. We have to so change tapes. Mm -hmm.